this is what the lecture is all about. Um, this is the most important molecule in medicine. How many are familiar with this? How many know what this is? Where's all the hands? The most important molecule, and you, you have no idea what it is. Give me a break. Uh, next slide. Let's turn it 90 degrees, and maybe you will recognize. Uh, next one. DNA. It's all about perspective. This is DNA, and that was a 90 degree view of DNA if you look down the tunnel, if you will. It's an information system, it's an energy system, but it's also a biological molecule all in one. Next slide. And so, this is what the lecture is about. The future is not what it used to be. And while that may seem rather redundant or simplistic, the, the important profound principle here is, at least in healthcare, the basic assumptions that we are making on a day-to-day -day basis to treat our patients are wrong. We are using industrial age and earlier technologies, and the rest of the world is living in the information age. So what does that mean next, in terms of healthcare, medicine, and simulation and training? Next, please. Uh, we think that the future is here. We believe medicine has come into the information age. Next slide. But actually, uh, it, it hasn't. We're trying to get there, and there's a couple things that we are exploring. And as I mentioned, the important part about the information age is our fundamental changes. And here are some of the fundamental changes that need to occur that are just barely beginning to scratch the surface. Next slide. Um, one of the area that is of keen interest, and my personal interest is there, is the area of robotics. And if you click on the uh, left side there, uh, robots we've had around for quite a while. Uh, this is from the movie Alien. And the one standing up is the cyborg being teased by the human. And the human is saying, no matter how good you are as a cyborg, you will never be as good as a human. And of course, the cyborg says, well, I take issue with that. Let me just show you. And they're going to play a little game called mumbly peg that children play when they get their first pocket knife. And so let's play a little mumbly peg, says the uh, alien. He says, trust me, I can do this. So that's what we think, if we can go to the next, uh, click on there. That's, that's what movies portray as. And I get a lot of our ideas from the movies, from science fiction books and so forth, because that's where the future lives. And so the question is now, what's, re what's reality? What have we got? Well, we now have the Phantom, which comes from uh, sensible technologies out of MIT there. And it's very similar to that robot. Can it do the same thing, an off-the-shelf robotic system that we have today? Even though this was a haptic device, it's also a robotic system. So as you saw within the movie, the first thing that the robot did was, the cyborg did, is he placed the knife between each finger so they would know exactly where it is. And so this is going to reproduce exactly, with an off-the-shelf robot, what was imagined in the movie Aliens. Well, you know, I'm, I'm vain. I'm a surgeon. I can do this good. Big deal. What do I need a robot for to do that? I can probably do that, too. Uh-oh. I think we're getting a little past my capabilities. This robot can do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no coffee breaks, and still continue with the same precision that it has right now. The point being that there are certain things that robots can do. Yeah, I know. Whoa, whoa, yeah, yeah, you didn't get stabbed. Okay. The idea here is that it's not so much a us against them, but rather which of their capabilities can we use and how can we incorporate them in the practice of medicine that we do today? And how do we have to train and simulate for that new kind of opportunity? Next slide, please. Uh, going back to the basis of the information age, the <clears throat> every profession, every industry except healthcare has a model of their product. In healthcare, my product is my patient in a non-pejorative way. This is what I deal with every single day. Now, we could have the capability of having a computer representation or an information representation of it, which would be a total body scan, in which we would embed all the properties of an individual human. And we can personalize it for that individual. So the medical record in the future can be a full 3D image of yourself down to the most minute detail and embedded with your data so when it's animated, it will behave the same way that you would. And we can update it as we add no more information, whether they be vital signs or biochemical data or so forth. The idea, we would instantiate in your personal image 
all of the properties and qualities of your body based on your day-to-day -day vital signs and other parameters and update that so that you would have, in essence, a surrogate of yourself, your own little avatar, inside of your personal medical record. We refer to this as a holographic medical electronic representation or holomer. And we believe that this is a true entity. It exists. It exists in cyberspace, but it is. The reason that this is so important is that this is the cornerstone of the healthcare of the future, in my view, for the next 50 to 100 years. This is the fundamental change which the healthcare profession has not accepted. And as you'll see, why it's so important for the type of stuff we're doing in modeling and simulation. Uh, this is what started as the visible human. Uh, DARPA did the virtual soldier, in which we took the heart and animated with specific data from an individual pig, and we were able to animate the heart so it beat in synchrony in exactly the same as the real heart would be. And we would update the heart and it would beat like that. So we know that we can do this. This is not an undoable thing. It's hard, but we can do it. Next slide. The, the, the importance of robotic surgery is it's basically an information system, if you will. Previously, in the industrial age, I would have to reach inside the patient and use real instruments and cut and sew while I touch their, their organs. We got halfway there with laparoscopic or keyhole surgery. I now operate on patients without ever looking at them. I look at the video monitor, which is the information representation of what's going on inside. But I still have the real instruments in my hand and I touch them. With robotic surgery, the revolution is complete. I no longer even touch my patient. So I look at the information and I move my hand and information goes to the tip of the robot and it cuts for me. So what I now become is an information manager. And you appreciate probably better than anyone the power of having this computer interface between me and my patients. And I can represent things in a way that I couldn't with my own eyes or own hands in terms of the sense of touch, but I also I can manipulate things in ways that I wouldn't be able to that are beyond physical limitations. When I sit down at the Da Vinci robotic system, I can do open surgery, minimally invasive surgery, I can do remote tele-surgery, I can do preoperative planning if I import the patient's image into my workstation. I can do surgical rehearsal. During surgery, I can bring in images, as you see down here, do data fusion between the preoperative image and the real-time video, and I can do intraoperative navigation and image-guided surgery. Or before I get started, I can go ahead and import a simulation I can warm up before I actually do my surgical procedure. And I can do everything, the entire process of surgery can be done from one place, which is the robotic work, uh, workstation that we have here. So that is why surgical robotics, in my mind, is the inevitable future of medicine. It's the only way that we can take power, take advantage of all the other powerful tools we have and integrate them into the practice of medicine. And the future direction, these are the things that we are going to begin focusing on. This came out of an American College of Surgeons uh, workshop. We have to focus on content, i.e. the curriculum. More cognitive assessment. Right now, almost all simulators are focusing on the psychomotor skills. We need to do the standardization, and then we need to do distributed training. Uh, there are very few, if any, uh, University of Washington has done their very first uh, uh, tele-surgical skills training between the University of Washington and the Boise VA, uh, uh, Boise Idaho VA Hospital where we have our, some of our residents and stuff. And so we did central lines and airway management and so forth with the faculty in Washington and the local faculty and the students out there in Seattle. So, the uh, opportunity to distribute the training over networks is going to be really important. Things that you've done for decades, we discovered them. Next slide, please. And this is what we think that we're going to need for the next generation of intelligent tutoring systems, the importance of saliency, what are the things that we need to focus on and which are irrelevant, and so on. Next slide. And these are the, these are the products that I would expect that the companies will be able to provide for us. Intelligent tutors inside of the simulators, more complex procedures, leading to digital libraries. One of the reasons, one of the things that distinguish a novice from an expert is experience. And part of that experience is the generic problem and then now how can I have many different experiences, congenital anomalies, different diseases and so on and so forth within that same type of thing. For example, there are, there are 21 different variations of the cystic duct to the common duct. We should know those. These are congenital anomalies. We have one. And so if the student understands that that's the way it is. They won't recognize what the variations are. So we need to provide that the experience, if you will, and be able to do uh, the procedures on those. That would give us our digital libraries. And finally, building them into surgical research 
uh, I mean rehearsal, which moves it out of the training lab into the clinical performance. What is the fundamental change that the, the information age is bringing to, to medicine, and what is being driven by the provision of medical care on the battlefield? Now, if you look at the future combat systems, they're going to more, what, information rich? They're working more towards robotic and autonomous systems. We have to do that in healthcare because that's the expectation. That's where the military is going. The Achilles heel for the battlefield is logistics, getting stuff where it needs to go when it goes. And if you read back in 1985, when Nicholas Negroponte wrote Being Digital, he said the fundamental concept behind the information age is replacing real objects with information. It's no longer atoms, but it's bits and bytes. All right, that's the key to the future. And therefore, how can I translate in the healthcare? Well, we want to go from tissues and instruments to information and energy. For example, betadine to sterilize tissue. I have to carry these great big containers of the sterilizing solution. Why don't we use plasma ion discharge just to sterilize it? We don't have any supplies. All we need is energy. And if I, I need the medical record far forward there, why am I carrying all these pieces of information? Why don't we download them on the PDA, which has already begun and so forth? So the idea here, in my mind, is that if we can leverage energy and information to replace a physical object that's being used today, we have a win. We have a win in uh, efficiency, in, in real-time timeliness, uh, and economy and so forth. Wherever you replace a, a real object, you have a win in many, many different directions. Next slide. Uh, here's one example. You know the handheld portable ultrasound uh, that you can put over it and the medics are carrying them around. We're developing high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is a form of energy that when, when the two beams come together, it generates heat and it can coagulate or vaporize tissue. And uh, this experiment shows that what we're, we're intending to do, and we've done our first clinical uh, uh, animal trials on it, is to cause internal hemorrhage, for example, perforating an artery, and then focusing the ultrasound on there and finding out, using the Doppler, where the bleeding is, putting the crosshairs on there and pressing the button for high-intensity focused ultrasound, beaming the energy right down on there and stopping the bleeding without ever having to operate. All right, and what you see here, if you click on that again, when the yellow dot appears, this is a clear lens from a, um, an eye of a cow. And when the yellow light goes on, that's when the ultrasound went on. And you see we've coagulated the tissues in there. That's what that white line represents, the coagulation of the tissue. If this were bleeding, it would have stopped bleeding. Notice there's no damage in between. So I can come from the outside of the body and stop internal bleeding without ever injuring the body or having to operate on people. Sound familiar? Somebody's wounded internally and they're bleeding and the medic runs up and goes, mm, and they're cured. You know, Star Trek anyone? It's not. It's just hard science. As a matter of fact, Steven Spielberg had it right. There is no such thing as science fiction, simply scientific eventuality. Many of the things that we've read about in the 50s and the 60s, what about Isaac Asimov, ring the world. You know, back then, before 1957, there was no such thing as satellites, but he imagined a world surrounded by satellites to give instant communication. It's here, all right? Next slide, please. We have the LSTAT, the Life Support for Trauma and Transport, took an entire intensive care unit, shrunk it down so that it was a six-inch platform underneath there. Two and a half million dollars shrunk down into a six-inch platform with full telemedicine capability. Next slide. And ever since 2000, we have been using it out on the battlefield. We've got about 40 or 50 of them out in Afghanistan. <clears throat> the soldier is wounded and placed upon it. Immediately, the surgeon back at the cache starts taking care of the patient as they're en route on the helicopter, adjusting the ventilator, changing the IV fluids, and so forth. Goes through all the echelons of care. Uh, triage in the operating room is operated upon him and take to the recovery room. During that entire time, two things occur. First, the surgeon, the doctor, is in complete care of this patient, knows exactly what's going on, and can treat them en route. And second of all, we have a complete permanent record that's continuously able to be generated automatically. So we now have the opportunity, once again, through information sciences, to be able to not only treat the patient, but keep a complete record as it's happening. We've never, ever had that capability before. Next slide. And as I mentioned, we're looking at unmanned air vehicles. The next generation that they're looking at now is unmanned resupply. And they have to do it with VTOLs, vertical takeoff and landings like helicopters and so forth, because you can't be landing in an aircraft. And so the idea is the autonomous VTOL in there. And if they're going to be having a bunch of these helicopters that are dropping off supply, 
Once they're done, they're going to be empty. 85% of wounded soldiers go back on vehicles of opportunity, whether it be a deuce and a half or a Humvee or, or even a tank, whatever's there, the closest vehicle they're going to drive that wounded soldier back to the, to, back to the uh, cash hospital. Well, that's what's going to be out there. Thousands of them, if you will. Right now, we've got 9,000 unmanned air vehicles on the battlefield, even more. So in the future, we are planning to, to adapt this so the next unmanned vehicle that's going to be out there for resupply will be available, next slide, uh, so that we can actually incorporate it in there and use them as vehicles of opportunity. And here's an example of all the different uh, types of helicopters that are out there right now, unmanned air vehicles. All of them are unmanned. Two of them are already in field trials. Next slide, please. Let me digress for a moment to a, an, another kind of surgery that you're going to need to learn about because we're going to need simulation and training for it. We have no training for this. And this is called natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. Notes. Some people call it transgastric or whatever. And it's through a flexible endoscope that you would put down in the stomach or maybe back up in the colon or through the vagina, through some natural orifice, make a hole in it. God forbid, that used to be a complication. And I, I, I was sued for it. Now I'm purposefully making a hole in the stomach, pushing my instrument out in there and getting inside of the belly, the abdomen, and actually able to operate without making an incision. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of some of the instruments that we're creating for them. And we can do, as you can see, they're removing some mucosa here. Two little graspers that are actually able to, to, to use to cut and remove tissue. Uh, this happens to be inside the stomach through the mouth. Uh, on the upper left, you see uh, a prototype of a suturing machine, a suturing device that can be used with the uh, flexible endoscopes. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, this is inside the abdomen. And you're looking at the worm, which is the appendix. And you're looking at the flexible instruments. This is a video, the raw video, of the very first time a patient has had their appendix removed with no incision, and it's removed out of their mouth. And so the way that they do it is they inserted this, this long instrument through the stomach and out into your belly. And then they used the instruments that were available. We need to develop some new instruments so we can do more complex procedures. But this is a standard, ordinary coagulating biopsy forceps that we use. And what, what he's doing here is he's reaching out and grabbing the blood vessels and coagulating them so that they don't bleed when the appendix is removed. And then once we've got control of all the blood vessels, we can reach down there with the suture, like a lasso, and if this is your intestines, and at the end of your intestines you've got this finger called your appendix. And so they're putting this lasso around it to tie it off, and then it's going to cut the appendix and remove it, the same way that we would do it if we opened you up. And so you saw him tying it off. Now he's using a coagulating sneer that allows us now to just cut at the base of the appendix and actually remove the, the appendix from there. So now we have the appendix off of the intestines laying around inside. Now this is a good search. He cleans his mess up after he's done, you see, and, and cleans everything up, makes sure there's no bleeding, no infection behind there. And then he has to reach down with another instrument and grab the appendix that is now lying there and, and remove it. We have to develop more and better instruments than what we have, but this is the beginning. And what you're seeing now is the very first time that a person has ever had the appendix removed through their mouth. Wow. Yuck. That's what everybody says, yuck, at the end. So you are now witness to the very first time in 2005 that someone had their appendix with no scars and no incisions. Next slide, please. How far this goes, <laughs> we're not sure. But the opportunity, so how do we train for this? We've never done this before. A new opportunity, if you will. Next slide, please. And my view is that because this is so awkward and difficult to do, what we need to do, the handle is so awkward, it was developed only for, for, for example, this is nothing more than a flexible borescope, all right? And so what we need to do is break that handle, take the flexible instrument, hook it up to the surgical workstation, and give us all these degrees of freedom, this beautiful interface that we've got for robotic surgery. We need to do this for this new kind of surgery. And once again, where do we sit? We sit at the surgical workstation. Next slide, please. I ran into Eric Laporta in Barcelona at a meeting. He built the operating room with no lights. I said, Eric, what do you mean no lights? He said, well, what I mean is these great big lights that I keep bumping my head into and I can never get exactly where I want to. We decided to get all of those out of the operating room and we're replacing the ceiling with a thousand LEDs, each one of them individually controllable and by voice activation. So now I can actually talk to the ceiling and tell it where I want it focused and actually get perfect light whenever I want to. And they were able to accomplish that. 
in the research laboratory. The problem was they were a victim of success. They were able to get this thing lighted from multiple directions at one time to a point that there was no shadows. And all of a sudden they realized they were having trouble seeing in 3D. Why? <laughs> they lost edge detection, they lost contrast, and so on and so forth. So now what they're doing is, well, can we do the opposite? Can we directionally light this to enhance the shadowing, enhance the edge detection and, uh, and contrast, and be able to actually improve our ability to see in 3D? So this is the beginning. And why do I show this tiny little device? Because this is a revolution in my mind. What we're talking about is changing the room, in this case the operating room, from a passive place where I put stuff in and I do my work to an active participation in my operation. The operating room is going to help me. I'm going to talk to the operating room and tell the operating room to do this, and the room will do that for me. Just as you'll see later on, we have the opportunity, if we track our supplies and we track our patient, we track them, so on and so forth, we can have the operating room watch what we're doing, anticipate our needs, order things for us. If we use sponges, they automatically count them, maybe with RFID or vision recognition, and automatically fill out the request form, and so on and so forth. So the idea is the operating room now has to be intelligent, but in a completely different way. It's an active participation. I interact with it, and it talks to the rest of the hospital. So as soon as the surgical procedure is done, the operating room talks to the logistics system and orders everything. I don't need my scrub nurse to do that anymore. The operating room knows better than I do what's been used. It's been tracking everything. And it doesn't need me or my nurse to tell logistics supply. They've got just-in-time inventory, supply chain management, asset tracking. They've got all those things. Why don't we just have the room talk to them? So I think that's going to be a fundamental revolution. How do we train for that? Do we need to? Are we going to rely upon the robotic system to do this for us? Next slide. This is um, Penelope. Penelope is the first uh, surgical scrub nurse that's actually a robot. And what Penelope can do is it, it has a vision recognition and a voice recognition system. You can talk to Penelope and, and, and do exactly the same thing a surgeon would do. Throw down my clamp and say, Penelope, I need a scalpel and hold out my hand. Penelope will find the scalpel and put it in your hand and then reach down, find where you threw the clamp back and replace it to the table. This is not to replace a scrub nurse. What this is is to relieve a scrub nurse of the tedious task of pick and place. You know, just like we saw in the beginning of the pick and place. I mean, industry's been using pick and place robots for decades, 30, 40, 50 years. As a matter of fact, the measurements I've been told is that a pick and place robot's performance, admittedly they're optimized, are between 10 to 12 times as fast as a human and about um, uh, 10 to 15 times as precise as a human. So it's got both in precision location as well as in time. It, it greatly exceeds, by at least in order of magnitude, the limitations a human body has on performing the same task. It's not that we cannot train a person to be that good because our body is not built to be optimized for that. So we now have the capability of doing that through robotic systems, and this, I think, is one of the first ones. Next slide. So we looked at all these technologies, oh, a bunch of stuff, not only in medicine but outside of medicine, and said, can't we make an operating room with no people? Surgeons are not operating on their patients anymore. Matter of fact, there's an operating room in, in Germany where the surgeon sits outside of the operating room and all the people are on the inside. Well, we get rid of all the rest of the people except for the patient. And so we decided to build that. And why would we want to do that? Well, on the battlefield, I can't afford to take people. As a matter of fact, the logistical tail is just as great for, say, a medic or a nurse that's back in the cache as it is for a soldier on the far forward battlefield. So if I can eliminate one job, that means I've got all these other people that I don't have to and all these other supplies I don't have to supply. An enormous burden that we're able to relieve. So, next slide. We put together, <clears throat> and this is the CAD cam of the operating with no people. You see the scrub nurse in the middle with her tool changer. There's our circulator nurse, which is a parts dispenser. Uh, there's our mail stand, and of course, the CAD cam from the actual Da Vinci system. We worked with the Da Vinci people. Uh, this is nothing more than the modified pharmacy robot. We've got those available today. Most pharmacies are using them for automatic suspension. So we had to build a tool change, and we got the Mitsubishi robot. Click on that, please. And this was it, that um, the surgeon would request the instrument. You would grab a new instrument, remove the old one, put the new one on, and then reach over for a supply, take a tray that has a supply in it, provide it for our surgeon. He could remove it just as if the scrub nurse was giving it to her, and then they could return it to the tray. Oh, anybody can do graphics. What have we got? Next slide. 
This is, and if you'll click right here on this circle, please, this should animate it. This is the operating room of the future with the uh, surgeon sitting there looking through a glass wall, and behind it was the operating room with no people in it. And notice we've got a mannequin on the LSTAT. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And we've got plenty of monitors so we can monitor what's going on in the operating room as well as see what's going on in the operating room. If needs to, we can slide the door and we can rush in for an emergency and so forth. <clears throat> So, if we need a new supply, we use the parts dispenser made by General Dynamics, the same group that makes Quick Script, the pharmacy that's available. 210 supplies, each sterilely packaged and automatically opened sterilely to make it available for the scrub nurse. She picks the sterile tray up. When it comes over there, the surgeon does what he does. You know, he looks at the nurse, scowls. No, he doesn't. And <laughs> Stops what he's doing and, and is able to actually remove the, the instrument for the tray and then goes back and provides the procedure. And this is simulated with the mannequin in place. The LSTAT provides the reference. You scan the patient on the LSTAT before they go in the operating room. The Da Vinci robot is talking and controlling the other robots. The surgeon is not. So it's an integration of a teleoperated system that is controlled by the surgeon and then those robot, that, that surgical robot is a surrogate for the surgeon and controls all the others. And this is an example of doing a tool change. So we can actually do the tool change. Interestingly enough, <coughs> a scrub nurse can change a tool on a, a Da Vinci robot today in 17 seconds. The surgical robotic system does it in 11 systems. This is at about one third speed, by the way. We had to slow this down so you could follow the motions and I could actually talk over it type of thing. So we can actually improve by about one third the performance in the operating room. The accuracy right now is 99.9. .9. We're not at 99.999 yet, but we're getting pretty close to that. All right. So there's a lot of things that need to be done, but this is the initial demo, the prototype of an operating room with absolutely no people in it. And this can be remotely controlled. We haven't done that. The, the surgeon, as you saw, was in the, uh, behind the glass wall, maybe three or four feet away. Okay, we can, we can get, go to the next slide, please. But, so you get the idea. Here's the surgeon. There's a technician that we're using for research purposes. Here's the operating room. There's the LSTAT. And then there's the robots in there. You close the glass door, and it becomes a clean room. Right now, clean room specs are what? Uh, class 10, 10 particles of uh, 10 microns in size per liter of air. An operating room is class 10,000, 10,000 particles. I mean, no wonder we have infections. We don't keep the room clean. Why? Because people have to traipse in and out. So just another advantage. Uh, and of course, we know about mobile robots, if you will. This is the first generation that does rounds. This is becoming immeasurably successful, including in the, the integrated stroke network. They're putting these in emergency rooms, uh, for example, in Michigan and in California. The neurosurgeon stays at UCLA or at the University of Michigan. And when a stroke patient comes to any one of 21 hospitals, they come in, this robot goes out, and the doctor actually starts taking care of the patient using this mobile robot. And it's better than telemedicine because they can move around and they can zoom in and out and so on and so forth. So it actually has greater capability than, say, our Polycom does and so forth. So this is, uh, every time I turn around and talk to these guys, they've discovered a new way to use these mobile robots. The patients actually love them, particularly on rounds. And why? They've got the choice. Either you can see your doctor on a robot or you can see somebody you've never seen before. And so the, patient, the, the, the robot comes in the room and they actually talk to the patient. And as a matter of fact, some of the patients said, you know, I prefer the robot to when my doctor comes sees me. <laughs> and I said, why would that be? He says, well, when the robot comes in, in order for the doctor to see me, he has to come, he has to look at me, have eye contact, and I could talk with him. And he says, when my doctor normally comes in, he's so damn busy, he runs and grabs a chart, talks to the nurse, checks the chart, says, are you doing okay? Fine, don't worry about it, I'll talk to your wife, and runs out. A little recriminating upon the behavior of our physicians today, and unfortunately, this has become, because this isn't what we teach them in medical school. We teach them these caring things. And what happens? The government has intervened, put in regulations, rules, administrative procedures, uh, quotas, and so forth, to a point that they don't have time to be nice. They can either be nice or they can be productive, but they can't be both. The requirements have become so onerous. Why is the healthcare system broken? Well, let's not go there. Next slide, please. Well, there's, there's two profound things that are happening right now. The scientific method we are discovering is inadequate. It will not suffice for the science of today. 
just like experimentation from the Age of Enlightenment was the best thing that they had available. They didn't have the scientific method. And we got things like Boyle's Law, the laws of thermodynamics, uh, gravity from Newton using experimentation. But they didn't do it with the scientific method. So we got better and we became the scientific method by putting hypothesis and randomized trials on there. But there are many things that the hypothesis-driven research or random clinical trials do not suffice for. There are some things that require things like intuition, creativity, and common sense, which is not part of science. As a matter of fact, it's almost poo-pooed by, by science today. But quite frankly, if you can't explain things like black holes, the event horizons, quantum mechanics, and so on and so forth, how are we going to improve on our science? There are too many things that we cannot explain by today's science. We are in a science crisis. And the reason is not so much that we don't know the science, the problem is we don't have the methodology for discovering this. Because things like creativity, intuition come before the hypothesis. How do we generate the hypothesis in order to do science? So whatever it is, and you know, people like Stephen Wolfram have been talking about a new kind of science. One of the important parts of wherever we're going is modeling and simulation. You see scientific method as it is today, actually we're doing this in a lot of ways, but most people don't even acknowledge, let alone recognize that they're doing modeling simulation as part of the scientific method. It's really important. And healthcare field, I can guarantee you, is absolutely clueless 100 percent. They think modeling simulation is build me a simulator and I'll do a suture. That's all they understand in modeling simulation. There's so much more to it. Next slide, please. Uh, if you believe Alvin Toffer, what you've seen is that we've had three ages that he's described, the agricultural, industrial, and the information age. Each one of them had a little tail at the beginning in a laboratory. And then finally the discovery took off. This is the revolution that occurs, if you will, that everybody recognizes. But what has happened is we've had a consumer acceptance. And when it does, what we've discovered is that there is no more revolution. It's all over. I maintain that we've not had a new discovery in information science in the last 20 years. Everything that we've got is better than what we had before. We're in this iterative stage. We're a bunch of Thomas Edison's. We've made the discovery, for example, 1972, cell phone, DARPA. Is there anything different in the cell phones today than what we had in 1972? They do the same thing. You pick up this thing, you press the buttons, and you talk to somebody. That's what they developed. Before, it was this big brick, and all you could talk, and you could barely hear. You know, in the future now, you've got everything on there, your MP3, your video, and, but it's still a cell phone. That's got all the bells and whistles in it. But nothing, what's the next generation of communications? Probably direct brain-to-brain -brain communication through some device. It'll come, but that's the next revolution, but that's not information science. That's bioscience. So perhaps the next revolution that is beginning right now in our biotechnology labs is one in which we're integrating biology with some of the others. Next slide, please. The future is this. We have fundamentally three disciplines, the biological sciences, the physical engineering sciences, information mathematics sciences. All new discoveries of major importance are occurring at the intersection of them. Is the human genome project a biological or is it an information science? And can we possibly do it without PCR or all these robots that do 10,000 samples an hour, not by hand, which is like three per day? So you cannot do future science without doing interdisciplinary. So that's what the future is. And uh, what are we doing with these multidisciplinary teams? God, I hate this slide. Cockroach, yuck. Robert Fuller, with one of his students, uh, Eric Stoediker, put tiny probes in the brains of cockroaches and had them run on treadmills and was recording their brain patterns. The purpose being, in this robotics lab, to understand why the most efficient motion machine on this planet, and after four and a half billion years of evolution, it better be efficient, why this efficient machine can run so well? Can we make, can we understand the running process and program them into our robots? Next slide. However, as you know, students sneak back at the lab at night and play, and they disconnected the wire from the computer, hooked it to a joystick, and started driving the cockroaches around the laboratory. <laughs> Three and a half million dollars to drive a cockroach around the laboratory. You know, Golden Fleece Award, anyone? But the question is, if we had taken that little chip camera from your cell phone and had a thousand of these, say, like at the World Trade Center and the Pakistani earthquake, how many thousands of lives could we possibly have saved? Just took a little imagination to take the next leap forward. So maybe that money wasn't so poorly spent. Next slide. 
Miniaturization is really important. Uh, there is the smallest supercomputer. It's mobile, 12 sensors. What it does is classified. Uh, we have here a tiny little pill camera called the Given Capsule and Endoscopy. It's a video camera that you swallow and it transmits two pictures per minute as it goes through your GI tract passively. And then instead of putting this long instrument in some orifice, and I see some of you squirming. You've, you've been there, right? You know, there's a long thing that goes, okay, instead of a colonoscope or a gastroscope, you just swallow this pill. And then you take out the videotape and review it later. They're looking at ways to control it now rather than having it passive. And there's even a group on seeing whether or not they can deploy tiny little pinchers to do biopsies, to actually take samples there, or use LEDs or, or lasers to be able to do hyperspectral analysis if they see something in there. So we're looking at ways. Now that we know that we can swallow these capsules and look at things, now can we start manipulating them? In the lower left, if you click it, as a matter of fact, uh, Dmitry Litnikov at the University of uh, Nebraska in Omaha has made a tiny little capsule, about twice the size of that, made a tiny incision in the belly button of a pig and dropped this robot on the inside and started driving the robot around inside the belly of the pig. The only thing that the robot at this stage has is a little video camera. Now they're looking at it with the laparoscope to show you uh, in a minute how the, the robot actually runs around on the inside. And then this is the video image that they have for the video camera. The only purpose really of this is showing that not only are we thinking about it, but we've got laboratories out there putting tiny little robots inside of you. 1972, Isaac Asimov, Fantastic Voyage, step one right here. Next slide, please. Um, femtosecond lasers. How many know femtosecond lasers? Yeah, I would expect a lot of you. You've got probably one of the, the, the foremost uh, biophotonics laboratory, optical laboratories right here at UCF. Phenomenal place, absolutely incredible. And they took the femtosecond laser, normally light is considered as continuous, but if you do ultra short pulses, it's also called the ultra short pulse laser. If you really, really fast pulse this thing, like at 10 to the minus 15, it's like shooting with little bullets. If you focus that on the membrane of a cell, we discovered when it hits that fast, there's no collateral damage. You just open a hole in the cell. And now you can reach inside with an optical tweezers or a MEMS technology and start operating on the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, or even get inside the nucleus as they are at Dundee, Scotland, and starting to operate on chromosomes and on genes. The future will be, perhaps, that surgeons will go ahead and find the original cells that started a cancer, go down to those cells, get inside of the nucleus, cut out the genes that caused this problem, put in new genes that will reverse the problem, and then let these cells go back and kill the rest of the cancer. That was originally the cancer that had spread from that site. So the idea here is being able to change the biology. Today, all procedures and all surgeon, surgeries work on tissues and organs and remove them or put them back together and occasionally transplant them. Nothing works on the biology. It's always on structure. So the revolution here is that we go from anatomical surgery down to biological surgery. Next slide, please. And incidentally, you work, next slide, from a workstation. Sound familiar, folks? Once again, reemphasizing the importance of the surgical workstation. You can sit down there all the way from the, the microscopic level all the way to the macroscopic level from one place and totally integrate the care from the surgical workstation, your information management system, if you will. Next slide. So perhaps in the future, with all these different technologies, we're going to have the operating room of the future look somewhere between what we have today and a surgical cockpit. Enormous amount of information available at the fingertips of the surgeon to be able to control it at all different levels. Next slide. Uh, MEMS technologies are really important. Here are some of the probes that we put in the brains of the cockroach. We modified them for monkeys. And what they have done is place these probes, next slide, into the brain of the monkey. <clears throat> and you can see with hundreds of these tiny little probes, they can, they can sample individual neurons. And then they, they would take a monkey and they would teach him a task. If it moves the red circle to the green circle, when they touch, a robotic arm comes over and feeds them a treat. So they've got a reason to learn this thing. And they can use a joystick or a touch screen or whatever. Five different universities working on this, uh, USC, Duke, MIT, so on and so forth. What we discovered <clears throat> was that it takes them about six weeks for the researchers to interpret the brain pattern, the actual way that they control this thing. And then they did exactly the same thing they did with the cockroaches. They would take the wire on the computer that's analyzing the brain pattern, 
connect it directly to the robotic arm. It takes the monkeys about two weeks to realize that they don't have to move their hand in order to feed themselves. We have five universities with families of monkeys sitting in front of computer screens, just thinking about eating and feeding themselves. <laughs> Next slide. The first clinical trials began in Jeffrey, a quadriplegic for two years. This is three months, click on that please. This is three months after he has had his brain implant, you see, called BrainGate, a commercial product. And they wanted to give um, Jeffrey some freedom. He's, resp he's C2 down, so he's dependent upon a resp, just like Christopher Reeves, all right? And so they put the chip into his brain, allowed a few weeks for everything to settle down, and now they have this connector that you connect on the skull. And that goes back to the computer. And so they asked him, they developed a couple programs for the computer, and they told Jeffrey, draw a circle. Now what you're seeing, once again, is raw data of the first time that a person is actually able to control a cursor on a computer with their thoughts. They also developed this program here for him on a practical aspect to be able to control his television. So it's very simple, very similar to what they did before, little buttons on the computer, on, off, change the channel, increase, decrease volume, and so on and so forth. But the remarkable thing is he's doing this simply by thinking. He's thinking, well, I want the volume up, I want the volume down, I want a beer, no, nope, that's not on this one, no, this kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> As you can see, we still have this thing really, really cumbersome, but they're working on actually being able to put a little RF transmitter on there and embed the whole thing inside and transmit it to an outside and then connect that to the computer. So there will not be any interface that we're working on there. Uh, they were really excited about this because this is completely unrehearsed. This is the raw data. And so one of the researchers said, you know, this is so cool, ran down the hallway to the prosthetics lab and got, borrowed one of their prostheses and impromptu hooked it up to the computer. And what you're seeing here now is the first time a human has ever controlled a robot or, or a prosthetic arm with their thoughts. He's actually opening and closing that hand just by thinking. So we know we can do it. And because of this, DARPA has gone into the intelligent prosthesis program, the upper extremity prosthesis that will be neuronally controlled. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I, I know a number of you have been working with, can we pick up these same signals without putting a bunch of damn probes in your head? Can we pick them up? A huge problem with signal-to-noise ratio. That's so low that we need to be able to pick these up and which ones do we interpret and so forth. But uh, this is a group I ran into at the University of Hawaii, but I'm, I know that there are others around. Can we actually control, for example, the computer just with our thoughts like we demonstrated with direct probes? And the answer is, hmm, really hard problem. We should be able to, but so far we're quite a distance away. Why do I even bother showing you this? Well, in the future, you may sit down at your surgical workstation and think your way through the surgical procedure. Remember, my robot's got 10 micron accuracy. And actually, we're getting down to one micron accuracy. Human, it is not physically possible. Now, repeat this. It is not physically possible because of the biomechanics to be able to position consistently with greater than 100 micron accuracy. These systems are optimized for precision. And we can go down to microns, and soon after that, we're going to go down to angstroms on the nano level. So that's why it's important. And I can't control it. It would be better if I think my way through the procedure. Next slide, please. Intelligent prosthesis. Now I'm going to go over a few things that are in the laboratory that are just emerging and then wrap up shortly afterwards with that. Uh, we've got the first soldiers, as you well know, that have gotten back to their uh, units after being able to uh, be completely rehabilitated with these intelligent above the knee amputations. Uh, intelligent prosthesis, a way to go. Arms, legs, cardiac, so on and so forth. Next slide. Cochlear implants. Tissue engineering, growing new organs, a whole nother area, if you will. We now have the results of the five year clinical trial of the artificially grown bladders on people with bladder cancer that Tony Atala at Wake Forest has removed their entire bladder took the stem cells, grew them a brand new one, and put their own grown stem cell bladder right back into their body. Incidentally, because it was grown with their own stem cells, they don't need a transplant surgeon. They don't reject these. We don't need all this horrible immunosuppression because it's their own stem cells. What does that mean? I mean, I'm a surgeon. I love stomach surgery. I know 23 different operations 
If you've got a cancer, I do this to your stomach. If you've got bleeding ulcers, I do this. If you've got a chronic ulcer, I do this. If you've got perforation, what's going to happen in the future to my practice? One operation for the stomach. No matter what's wrong with you, I'm going to take out your stomach and give you a brand new one. Just like your car. When's the last time anybody fixed anything in your car? They don't fix anything. They find the broken part, remove it, and put in a new one. This is in all other industries. Why aren't we doing it? Well, we haven't had the parts, but now we do. <laughs> the question is for your hospital. How about for hospital practices? You know, are we going to have to have not only a blood bank, but a body organ bank? Are we going to have to be able to create organs in hospitals? Or are we going to have to ship them from a place that they're grown to a I mean, there's a whole host of, of issues in here. My view is that the work that is being done in the various tissue engineering labs is so revolutionary that in 20 years from now, we're not going to recognize medicine as we know it today. Next slide. And we can steal from nature. This is the orbit spider that makes the strongest known fiber on this planet. And next year, technology clipped out the genetic sequence and put it in goats and now has unlimited quantities of the protein that makes the strongest planet fiber. What does this mean? It may well be that in the future, instead of manufacturing things with bricks, mortars, and smokestacks, we'll just put them in animals, herds of animals, or fields, and actually grow what we want. Talk about the green world. What a revolution that would be for pollution. So we now know how to ask nature to do things for us that previously were not possible. Things that they're already doing, but we can do it in our own way. Next slide. This is transgenic, by the way. And finally, uh, one of my more favorites, this is suspended animation, starting with hibernation. And uh, Brian Barnes in Alaska was working on Arctic ground squirrel and discovered that they hibernate not because it's cold, but they have the ability to turn themselves off. We have no idea how it is. We don't know what the stimulus is. But we do know that if you ablate the suprachiasmic area of the hypothalamus, if you ablate that, and throw these animals out, they freeze to death. They can't hibernate. So there's some signal, some molecule, that is stimulated in the brain that goes throughout the body. And we also know that it happens to end up on the mitochondrion in each individual cell. And what it does is it gets in that place between NAD and NADH and coenzyme A, where oxygen comes by and transfers one electron to ADP to ATP, which is our energy source. Mark Roth at uh, Hutchinson Cancer Center discovered that he can mimic this by using hydrogen sulfide in small quantities. Sulfur is one down from oxygen and it holds onto its electrons more tightly. And so if you replace some of the oxygen with hydrogen sulfide, it binds preferentially, but it won't give its electrons up. And what happens to these animals is, is they, they stop. They have no heartbeat, they have no EKG, no respiration, their body temperature becomes ambient, whatever the room temperature is, that's their temperature. You put them in an MRI machine, functional MRI, there is absolutely no evidence of brain activity. They meet every known criteria of death, absolutely every criteria of death. And I said, well, what's going on here, Mark? Are these dead? He said, no, no, no. He said, they're in suspended animation. I said, well, what do you mean? And he answered the question. He said, what is the most exciting thing that you would you ever do in your life that uses the most energy? No, it's not that. That's not it, all right? <laughs> the answer is dying. Just before you die, you have the survival mechanism in you. We call this the agonal gasp, in which you activate every known system in your body. Alternate pathways to get around whatever was wrong. You, you, you expend an enormous amount of energy just before you die trying to save yourself. But he says, if I go ahead and block that, you cannot die without a lot of energy. That's not possible. I says, well, what does that mean? He says, well, a new definition of suspended animation. You're neither alive nor you're dead because energy cannot flow. And in the absence of energy, you can't die, but you're not alive. So we have to relook at this. I says, well, yeah, great theory. What's the proof? Put these mice under a bell jar, added hydrogen sulfide and subtracted some of the oxygen. Six hours later, put the oxygen back in, poked out the elder. The first thing they did is they went through the maze to try to find their food because they were absolutely starved after six hours. And they remembered exactly how to get through the maze, and they remembered how to, to, to feed themselves. 
so we think that they're neurologically intact after six hours of meeting every known criteria of death. I don't know where we're going with this, but it's exciting. We're going to the next stage, which is going to be large animals. Next slide. As you know, technology is moving along and business is trying to take opportunities of them, but our response in the social sciences, and particularly in healthcare, has to be more measured. We can't jump on every bandwagon. And so the moral, ethical issues that are corresponding to these technologies are so far behind. Next slide. For example, uh, the technology is not evil. It's not good. It's not evil. It's actually neutral. And at least in healthcare, it's up to us, and in you in the engineering field, it's up to you to look at these moral and ethical issues so that we can apply them appropriately. Next slide. So some technologies, you know, human cloning, and what was the moral response to that? The knee-jerk, knee-jerk reaction, next slide, was 190 of 193 countries banned human cloning, except for three, Korea, China, and Switzerland. There are two institutes in China that have state-sponsored human cloning, and there's one in Korea. And then there's the, the private one over there. So the idea is that we are now cloning. But we never answered the moral and ethical issues. Should we be doing Why does China need to clone? For God's sake, they got enough people. <laughs> you know, they should stop cloning, for God's sake. OK. But anyway, next slide. Genetic engineering. You probably didn't know that the first genetically engineered child was born in 2003. And it was because of uh, certain things, characteristics that they wanted. But we now are looking at something called savior babies, in which if you have a first child that has a defect, PKU, von Wildebrandt, or some congenital disease that can be corrected, you can have another baby. You genetically engineer that baby so when they're born, you can remove their tissues or their blood and save the one with the defect. Should we be doing that? I mean, that sounds worthwhile. The baby had no choice. He was genetically engineered. What does the church think of that? Is that do we have the right as, as homo sapiens to do what God created? Don't know. We've got to really start talking about that. Next slide. Oh, wait. Before we go on to the next slide, I told you, remember about the spider. We also know that the human has four rhodopsin in its eye that allows it to see in the visible spectrum, but it doesn't activate the two that look in the ultraviolet or the infrared. The rhodopsin is there, we just don't use it. The pit viper does. It finds its prey in the, ultraviolet, in the, in the infrared. And the hummingbird finds its flower, flowers with ultraviolet. Why don't we just take that little genetic sequence and give it to your daughter? Now she can see in the dark. Nobody else can. Should we do that? I mean, she is going to be so much better off than anybody else. Will it have undesirable consequences? It will never be dark for her. We can do that. We've been doing it. Should we do it? Who's going to decide? A politician? A lawyer? Where are we? We need to be at the table. As responsible scientists, we need to look at this. Next slide. Longevity. There are three strains of mice that live at least two and a half to three times normal lifespans, whether it be manipulating apoptosis, regulating the telomerase, uh, doing the glycemic index factors, and so on and so forth. We know how to extend life in the laboratory for a minimum of two to three times the normal lifespan. Should we be doing that? If we give it to your granddaughter, now she's going to live 200 to 250 years. Social Security is going broke. <laughs> There's no way. What are you going to do for, you know, 150 years after you retire? Are we going to retire then? Who's going to get this? Who's going to get to live that long? Can we afford, as a species, to do that? We can't even feed the people we have if all of a sudden people don't die for 200 years and they keep on getting bored. We need to think about that. Next slide, please. Uh, intelligent robots, as you know, uh, if you read Kurzweil, Morvac, and the other, they've done all these computations about the humans computed four times 10 to the 19th computations per second. Uh, Red Storm, now it's at 35 times 10 to the 15th computations per second, 1,000 times slower than the human brain. Moore's law is not changing. Do the math. 2015, 2020 at the latest. Computers are going to be computing faster than the human brain. Are they going to be intelligent? Will we be able to recognize that intelligence and commu com communicate with them? Will we have to give them rights if they're intelligent? If we pull the plug, is that murder? Will they remember that we made them? Will they even care? Will they need us anymore if they're more intelligent than we are? Science fiction, yes. Hard science, also yes. 
Next slide. Is this what the robot of the future is going to look like? If you'd click on that, please. This is from the animatronics from the movie industry. The interesting thing about this is that the face that you see there, and you've seen many in the different uh, movies, is one that is regulated by a very, very large number of sensors and actuators in the face there. What's unique about this is Dave Hansen talked to Rosalind Picard at MIT, head of affective computing. You can talk to this robot. It will interpret by the tone of your voice, the content of your sentence, the emotion you were probably trying to express, and will not only answer you, but will try to give the appropriate emotional facial expression that a human would give. And they're pretty darn good at that. And if you ask them a question that they don't know, they cock their head, they roll their eyes back, little minute mannerisms, if you will. You can look at Georgia Tech's uh, 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 ontology for facial expression and be able to translate that into mechanically representing that. Very, very interesting. So perhaps in the not too distant future, we're talking 10 to 20 years at the latest, we'll have robots that will look human and when you ask them questions, they will give you facial expressions that will have, quote, emotional content in them. Very, very interesting. Uh, something to look at for avatars and for other areas that you're working in. Next slide, please. And finally, I showed you intelligent prostheses, growing artificial organs and so forth. We can probably grow 95% of your body right now. The question is, if I replace all of your body parts with something artificial, are you still human? What makes you human? Is it this flesh and blood that we were born with, or is there more? Now, this is a profound question that we're going to have to try to answer. I don't know. As we replace more and more, we get to live longer with artificial parts. When do you go that line? Next slide, please. Well, I tried to show you some of the problems, the moral and ethical issues that we have here, and I'd like to just quote or paraphrase, if you will, Francis Fukuyama from the uh, President's Commission on Biomedical Ethics in 1999 and published his book, next slide, called Our Post-Human Future. And his, his quote goes something like this. For the first time on this planet, there walk upon this planet a species so powerful that it can control its own evolution at its own time and its own choosing. That species is Homo sapiens. And so my question to you is what will you choose to make as the next species on this planet? Thank you very much. Thank you.